My name is Lisa Tostado. I work for the Heinrich Böll Foundation and I work mostly on climate policies. And I have the honor to, to moderate this debate today. Um, I'm actually speaking to you from Paris, but I'm usually based in Brussels. And here in Paris, we are just a couple of hours away from the second nationwide lockdown. Oh, well. Um, so let me present the two panelists that are already here. So we have Sam van der Plaas, who is um, a policy director at Carbon Market Watch. That is a not-for-profit association focusing on carbon pricing and policies to, to do so. And Sam is an expert on EU climate policy, carbon markets, the EU emission trading system, and the industrial decarbonization. So thank you, Sam, for joining in from Ghent today. Glad to be here. Thank you, Lisa. And then our um, second panelist is Kingsmill Bond, who is an energy strategist um, at Carbon Tracker. That is an independent financial think tank that carries out analysis on the impact of the energy transition on capital and financial markets. And as such, he has performed research, for instance, on the impacts of the U.S. shale gas boom. Um, and he has most recently, with his colleagues, launched a report that's entitled The Future is Not in Plastics. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more on that one, King Snow. Thank you for joining in from Oxford. Thanks, Lisa. So um, today we're getting together to talk about the oftentimes overlooked upstream negative climate impacts of plastics. As the movie said, um, I think it was a lady right at the beginning, um, the people are, tend to be much more aware about the plastic pollution crisis because it's um, easier to communicate on that with, you know, impressive images on plastic pollution in the oceans and um, littering on the environment. But the negative impacts upstream that are associated with fossil fuel extraction and plastic production are um, somehow less known and also less addressed by policymakers. And that is a crucial blind spot for also for the EU and its plans to decarbonize its economy um, with the European Green Deal that com comprehends several commitments such as zero pollution environment, circular economy, and also uh, climate neutrality by 2050. Um, today, plastic production is mostly based on crude oil, which is called NAFTA. But um, some players, as Dorothee just mentioned, such as Ineos, also started to use derivatives of fracked gas as feedstock. And the negative climate impacts are becoming more and more um, evident with new research. And um, to these e ecological problems, um, we can add financial ones. And I think Kingsmill is going to talk more about that. Um, the fracking industry and also the oil and gas industry are facing, facing um, tremendous financial problems. And they are now betting more and more on the petrochemical industry um, as, as, as a future factor for demand growth. And even that one is a very shaky and, and risky bet. Um, and all this is, is um, happening at a time where we really need to tackle the climate and the plastic crisis both at the same time. Um, and yet new facilities are still being planned both in the US and in the EU. And we now want to talk about how that can go together with the European Green Deal. And we want to talk about these, these complex interlinkages between climate change and, um, and plastic production that are oftentimes overlooked. And we also want to talk about what kind of legislation we need to curb emissions from the sector, because unfortunately, virtual plastic production is not going to stop overnight either. And we also want to talk about policies um, that can stop, uh, that can help stop producing ever more virtual plastics. And I just see that Martin joined in. Sorry for being late. Uh, yeah, the ticket was missing. Sorry about that. It's all it's all good. So um, our third panelist, Martin Hoysiek, is from Slovakia. He is a member of the European Parliament since 2019 and has served as a member of the Envy Committee and a substitute member of the ITRE Committee. So he's um, a specialist on environment and industry and has worked on circular economy, plastics, and has also been an advocate for more ambitious climate policies and, um, and gas. So thank you, Martin, for joining in today. Are you in Slovakia right now or Brussels? No, I'm in Brussels. Okay. So we have Brussels, Ghent, Paris and Oxford here on this virtual panel and people from all over the world listening. So I was just done with my little intro. Um, and to, to kick off the, the conversation, um, I would like to address my first question to Kingsmill, because in your report, The Future is Not in Plastics, you um, that was launched just two months ago, you state that plastics impose a massive untaxed externality upon society. 
Can you briefly explain what you meant by that? Why are there so many negative externalities attached to it, especially upstream, which is, um, again, uh, less known by a public? And maybe Sam and also Martin can then um, add on to that, how we can address that, um, how can we internalize these externalities, and how can we make the polluters pay? Sure, brilliant. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak uh, again, Lisa. So, look, um, and uh, just to um, just quickly to uh, clarify a term which is not always widely used, what is an externality? An externality is a cost that's paid for by society, uh, not by the producers. So if you think, for example, about a paper factory um, making paper and dumping the waste uh, chemicals into a river, which then kill fish, uh, which then destroy the livelihood of fishermen, the, uh, the fishermen pay the externality and the paper company makes the profit. Um, so uh, it, it's important, therefore, to realize that externalities are a real cost and people people pay for them with their lives and with their livelihoods. Um, so when we don't charge them, it's not like they don't exist. They still exist. It's just other people pay for them. Um, and, and herein lies the problem, because what's really extraordinary about plastic is that the, the externality cost per ton, uh, as I'll, I'll lay out in a moment, it is about $1,000, um, which means that the industry is imposing a cost upon the rest of society of around $350 billion a year. Um, and, and they're just not paying for that. Um, and, and people often say, well, OK, but how about the EPR costs? And, and, and we worked out in our analysis that actually... Uh, the industry, the subsidies to the industry through through subsidies to oil are higher than all of the uh, EPR uh, costs that are being paid. So we, we have a really strange situation, actually, which has crept up upon the world of, of this industry polluting with impunity. So, so just to explain, what are the four components of the externality? How do we get to $1,000? So um, the, 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 there are four things we can quantify. There are actually a series of areas which are mentioned in the film that you can't quantify very well yet, um, like the microplastics. But anyway, the four that you can quantify, one is ocean plastic. Um, got a research done on that, the, um, probably the, the most detailed piece of analysis done by the unit, which suggests that the cost per tonne is about $50 to $100. There's other research suggesting it's much, much higher than that, but let's start with that. Um, then you have the collection and sorting costs, which is, uh, according to Systemic, around $250 or $300 a tonne, uh, just to pick stuff up and sort it. Um, then you have the carbon dioxide uh, cost and to be clear, plastics is responsible for around five tons of carbon dioxide per ton of plastic. Um, put a, a kind of fifty dollars per ton, which is a low end cost of on, on onto onto that carbon dioxide, and it's two hundred and fifty dollars per ton for for carbon dioxide. And and then finally, you've got the toxins again talked about in the film, all of the air pollution uh, that people have to breathe. Uh, and and as a good rule of thumb, that's usually about the same. Um, as the as the cost of tar carbon dioxide, so another two hundred and fifty dollars. And the point simply is, you add all this stuff up, it gets you a thousand dollars. And 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 actually, the the initial solution to solve this problem, I would suggest, is actually incredibly simple. Um, clearly, Martin, it's not simple because you have to do you have to force the legislators to do it. But nevertheless, in theory, it's simple, which is you make the polluters pay, um, which in economic terms internalizes. The externality, and there was a lady at the end of the film who, who, who I think quite correctly said, "Look, if you internalise the externality, you solve the problem overnight." Um, because as soon as you do this, um, all of the people producing the plastic and using the the plastic find ways uh, to, to to reduce usage. And f final observation, Lisa, you know, this is we spend a lot of time trying to think of very clever ways to reduce plastic usage. Um, we don't actually need to do that. You just put the tax on, and people figure it out. And and, and a good example is what happened in, in the UK, for example, when we started charging people for water. Um, you know, they just basically stopped. They turned the taps off. They replaced leaking taps. Um, and in Russia, when they started charging people for heat, they, they, they closed the windows in wintertime. You know, it's not very difficult, actually, once you start to internalize the tax to have a very significant impact upon a, a bloated industry. So I hope that's a, a useful introduction to externalities. Thank you. I think that was very clear. Sam, would you like to add on to that? How, how has your work so far related to, um, you know, policies that could help um, internalize these externalities? Sure, I'm happy to. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Lisa. Um, uh, at Carbon Market Watch, um, 
we're really we're a relatively small NGO. There are ten people of us based in Brussels, uh, and we're really focusing on uh, carbon pricing policies uh, in Europe, but also uh, globally. So uh, this is for us very much um, a question about uh, internalizing those external costs, but then the external costs related to the climate uh, crisis and, and the way carbon pollution uh, globally and in Europe causes and contributes to that. Um, I think, uh, th th let me first start by saying, I think the, the, the movie that was shown earlier, I think it's excellent to really explain how plastic pollution and what ends up on the beach is, is just the tip of the iceberg. And um, really, uh, it's part of a nexus of environmental impact. Um, water and air pollution, uh, the climate crisis, uh, plastic waste, um, very much all the different sides of the same uh, coin. And um, it comes at a very interesting time, especially, and I'll focus a bit on the European uh, agenda specifically right now, with the European Commission, uh, its Green Deal, uh, the goal of climate neutrality, uh, the prospect to uh, increase the European greenhouse gas emission reduction target to at least 55% by 2030. Um, these are steps in the right direction. They don't go far enough. Uh, that's a slightly different debate, but uh, let's be clear that uh, those goals need to be made stronger and more adequate to uh, limit the crisis, climate crisis. Uh, it becomes now increasingly clear that all sectors, including the petrochemical and plastics uh, industry, will have to contribute. Um, and um, because climate neutrality means basically there's no place to hide uh, anymore. Um, and for the plastic sector, because it has um, extremely long investment cycles, you don't build a cracker uh, every five years. Once it's there, uh, it stays online for, for decades. It means basically that uh, climate neutrality needs to start today. Um, so it's really important uh, that um, these sectors also uh, roll up their sleeves and uh, get to work. Because now coming to the issue of uh, internalizing the external cost, uh, let's be very clear that the current uh, tools we have to do that in Europe, despite uh, a principle in the European treaty which says that the polluters shall pay, uh, that this is uh, not respected at all when it comes to industrial decarbonization. And I mean industrial decarbonization when I talk about steel, cement, but also and here the, the petrochemical sector. Those sectors have not reduced their emissions for at least the past eight years. Since 2012, uh, it's a flat line of greenhouse gas pollution, despite all the climate goals, despite the climate crisis, and despite having the EU ETS uh, emissions trading system in place uh, in Europe. And this is no surprise because more than 90% of all the carbon pollution from those sectors has no price tag attached to it. There is a massive handout of free emission allowances under the ETS, um, which is basically, uh, I think, a hidden scandal of European uh, climate policy making. And it's something that needs to be corrected if we are serious about solving the problems which were, so, which were shown uh, in, in the movies. Yes, thank you. I think we will come back to the ETS because it's quite an important uh, uh, issue. And it's also, as of now, basically only tool that the EU has been using to decarbonize. Um, and, and, and right now they are looking into other tools as well with the very, well, with a, an ambitious goal of decarbonizing um, rapidly now. Um, I would like to, to come to Martin now and also I'm um, looking at the chat. There were questions about, um, well, first of all, taxes alone will probably not help. Um, and Kingsman has already responded to, partly, at least, to that question. But maybe Martin, you also want to um, to say something about that uh, when it comes to decarbonizing the, the petrochemical sector in Europe. What helps? Um, what are your ideas? What is the European Parliament discussing right now? 
And a second question um, would be about uh, a very topical and a timely thing, which is the uh, new Ineos plant being um, being built or being planned at least at the at the port of Antwerp that actually relies on these very problematic supply chains that we have um, seen in the movie. Um, so derivatives of shale gas uh, from the US um, LNG imported to Europe and then transformed into new virgin plastics at a time where, you know, the EU, the EU has actually committed to reduce both its greenhouse gas emissions and um, and plastics. So, um, Martin, what, what's your stance on that, please? Ooh, um, well, if, it would be, if, it, if it would be uh, that easy. But uh, no, uh, to start, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be part of the panel. It's it's really interesting discussion. And uh, I think, Gizmo, what you said at the beginning about the internalizing of the externalities, uh, and the polluter pays. We have uh, lots of bold words uh, in the legislation, and sadly, often like also then kind of how to get it into practice. And also, the free handouts are are something of of, the, of an example in this, where uh, what one hears from at least parts, not not all of the industry, is uh, please give us the carbon border adjustments, but free continue with the free handout. It kind of handouts doesn't really work together. Um, I think what is crucial here uh, is beyond trying to find a way how to bring in the external cost. And there's been an attempt, for example, uh, and I'm a big fan of extended producer responsibility, trying to find a way how to incorporate the entire life cycle and individualize it, at least on the financial level. So we don't have to have physically separate infrastructure, but there is a differentiation which would enable uh, kind of the driver for change to be on per company basis and therefore kind of use the, also the market forces uh, to drive the innovation. I think what we need to look at, and that's an interesting aspect here, is this is in some ways a lot of climate problem and a pollution problem, but the solution is in a circular economy. This is where in some ways what we need to look at is how we manage the materials. And I'm kind of, I have an ambivalent relationship with plastics uh, as with almost everything else. It, you know, it's a, it's a good servant, but a, but a very bad Lord, as we say in Slovak and my rough translation of this saying is, and then right now we are ruled by plastic rather than the plastic is serving us. Uh, and that's because we ended up in a linear model. Now, one of the challenges that we face in a, in a short term is and then what I see in the last days, weeks, is an attempt to undermine the kind of the push for move to a circular economy by the incineration industry, which under the disguise of energy recovery is saying, hey, you know, burning all this waste and is uh, re and recover and taking energy from it is renewable, it's circle, it's good. Um, honestly, it's not. It's creating fossil based CO2 emissions. It's uh, wasting valuable resources if you burn the organic waste, which uh, contains the nutrients that belong back to soil, and actually relies a lot on the plastic to be burned to provide the fuel, which is a fossil carbon. And I think this is something where we have to watch very closely what the Commission, and I haven't seen yet in detail the leak that came out today on the Delegated Act on the Taxonomy, on the mitigation, I hope that uh, the incineration hasn't, the lobby hasn't succeeded to put itself into that. We are trying to exclude uh, the incineration uh, as, as a way of dealing with, uh, as a potential green investment. Uh, so we need to push for very clear prioritization and kind of using of the waste hierarchy in a legal way, which will, I think, be important component in motiva motivation for the industry to look uh, for closed loop systems. So we, you know, and in the discussion, whether it's gonna be to some extent for sound based or whether it can be based in terms of a plastic now, I mean, or it can be fully based uh, or to large extent based on uh, bio-based plastic. I'm not on either side, but I think the key is to now look for ways, okay, how we can, on one hand, of course, limit the use of plastic, but whatever plastic we use has to be part of the circular loop. 
it's nice that you see here in Brussels. I, I moved a few months ago to Brussels be, to avoid commuting. And uh, it's nice if you see that, you know, if you buy something in IKEA and you have on it special designation, this is the type of plastic, where here everything but the PET uh, and uh, Tetra Pak goes to incineration, you know. So we really need to kind of see how to connect these and create an environment where the businesses are uh, discouraged or idly prohibited from going to silk uh, to, to linear systems and are encouraged and the framework is creating where we channel investments into transformation into the circular systems. Of course, toxic free, I don't wanna go into detail. And mm -hmm. this is gonna be the question big question for, uh, but, uh, first of all, the use of public money in the recovery plans, because let's be honest, lots of these projects, lots of these projects for using, uh, for creating new capacities for plastic production, lots of the projects for insertion are at least hoping, if not relying on public money, your, yes. my money. And I think this is very important to realize. It's not even clearly making so much business sense, I'm afraid. Yes, thank you. That was a very good bridge to what's going on in the chat and also to my next question. So you made it clear that we have to to think in, in more circular ter terms and thinking of about the upstream, the, the use phase, but also the downstream. But every circle kind of has to start somewhere. Um, and um, that brings me to that question, that big question of stranded assets. So we met, briefly mentioned the um, Ineos plant relying on that frack gas to produce more virgin plastics that is in the stage of being planned right now. Um, and uh, Kingsmill, you've wrote in the chat that it is likely to, to end up as a stranded asset as well. And in your uh, report, you also make the argument, the financial argument, that the uh, oil industry is pinning its hope on strong plastics demand growth. Um, but you don't think that this will materialize because the, the EU and also the other, other countries of the world uh, start to really tackle the problem of plastic waste and also act on climate change. And in your report, you're predicting um, a plastic, uh, virgin plastic demand peaking in 2027. So there is a stark contrast, you know, between um, these hopes of the of the incumbents and that bet on on demand growth, um, and at the same time that need to to stop production. So unless this is stopped, we that will result in continued low prices and stranded assets, as you said. So can you develop a little bit further? How did we even get ourselves into that situation where we are still like planning plans that don't even make economic sense. How did we get there? Yeah, it's, it's completely crazy. I mean, it's uh, it's quite good timing, I guess, for this call that the news should come out today. But um, you know, these these companies and their backers, their financial backers, will regret this kind of decision because we've we've seen this movie before. You know, it's like the the coal sector deciding to build new mines in 2012. It's like the electricity sector building new coal-fired power stations in 2011. You know, they're very confident they're going to get used, and they never did. Um, a lot of these things never got switched on. Um, so this is this is a, a shocking waste of capital uh, that's that's going on. But let me explain why, because I'm actually, interesting enough, we, you know, we're not at Carbon Tracker. Uh, with Carbon Tracker, we are actually, I would say, specialists in the whole issue of stranded assets. We were founded 10 years ago to focus specifically on the consequences of the energy transition um, uh, and, and the way it would create stranded assets. So we, you know, this is an argument we have been making for a decade and we've seen play out in a number of industries. So just to explain what is a stranded asset, it, it occurs when an industry plans for growth in supply, but there's no growth in demand. Um, and, and that gap um, between supply and, and demand is no longer required production capacity, and that's a stranded asset. Um, and, and what... And what um, the, the reason we're particularly interested in the plastics industry is if you look across the global um, energy system right now, many areas have begun to realize that change is coming and they've changed their plans and they've uh, reduced their plans for expansion, but not plastics. So the plastics industry is uniquely stupid um, because they are not listening at all to what's going on in society. And they're planning on, as, um, as, as we said in the previous session, they're planning on a doubling of capacity over the next uh, 20 uh, years. And, and what they're therefore going to face, they're going to face, so you double capacity over 20 years. If you want to make money, you have to have a doubling of demand in the next 20 years. Um, 
from an industry which is already massively polluting, um, where there's huge societal pressure um, and there's huge number of technology solutions which are materializing to, uh, to, to, to enable demand to stop rising. And I should stress here because it's, somebody said in the chat, well, you know, this kind of solution doesn't get you to zero. Actually, to have a stranded asset and, and financial losses, you don't need to go to zero. You need simply to stop the growth. Um, so, so the kind of gap that we see between likely growth um, of plastics demand in the next five years and planned growth uh, is, is, implies that you're going to have $400 billion of stranded petrochemical assets, including the INEOS facility. Um, and um, that is, is uh, yeah, that's highly damaging for the industry because it creates an environment of continuous overcapacity, which reduces prices right, right across the board. But in addition to that, um, it has very significant consequences for the oil industry because the oil industry itself um, is betting its future on plastics, which is a pretty sad situation to be in. But basically, all of the other drivers of, of oil demand growth have, have been falling away. So like 10 years ago, it was meant to be cars and then Elon Musk came out with an electric vehicle. And so they've given up on cars and you know, COVID has killed airlines as a big, uh, a big hope. And now trucks are also disappearing because you get electrification of trucks as well. So the only area which now accounts in the IEA forecast for 60% of expected growth of, of oil demand in the next decade is plastic. Um, so therefore, if, if we're right and, and legislation plus technology create an environment where uh, actually you, do, you can curtail uh, demand growth for plastics. It has consequences, not just for plastics, but the oil industry as well. And, and increasingly you see this, I mean, investors, so I, I speak from an investor perspective and investors see this. This is why the, the oil sector is down 60% year to date. Um, and, and, and this is why uh, y you've seen really devastating impact on, on many of the uh, fossil fuel uh, companies, as people begin to wake up to it, I think they're now starting to wake up to it in plastics as well. Is the EU waking up to that as well, Sam and Martin, in, in the policies? Uh, Martin, you briefly mentioned the recovery package. Is, uh, are, are EU policies aware of that issue? And if so, how is it implemented and how should it be um, implemented policy-wise? Good question. Um... To some extent, it's it's still yet to be to be seen if we have woken up. Uh, and I think this is something where, you know, uh, and uh, and Kingsbury again uh, said it quite right. It's the risk of stranded assets here, and the kind of the the attempts to um, rescue the oil industry uh, or to rescue themselves from the oil industry are for me reminiscent almost of the you know, uh, horse carriage industry 100 years ago, uh, when within the 50, when, when they were dismissing at the very beginning, let's look at it, they were dismissing the car industry. And I'm, I'm not saying it that I'm a big fan of them, but uh, they were dismissing the chains of car industry to having breakthrough and within 15 years they were gone. Um, what we're facing right now, um, it's really time of, of disruption. Uh, what the mobile phones cost to a uh, number of sectors and the growth of internet, number of sectors from, uh, you know, not just the, the rental of DVDs, but to, from that to banking, to transportation, to everything else, is in some ways now starting. And I think this is uh, not only from the point of view of, uh, you know, ensuring the our survival as a species and, and survival on the life of this planet, which are very much the core of my values, but even purely economically, I think, especially in terms of using public resources, it's essential that we really wake up to this. Um, and I'm looking forward to see what's going to come out in terms of implementation of the circular economy strategy, uh, circular economy action plan from the Commission, uh, because this is going to have big implications for it. Because it's this uh, hidden carbon in the plastics that it's going to then end up, uh, so to say, laying around and, and lurking around. And um, we will still have to see, of course, if uh, we will be able to wake up as, as legislators, if we will be able to see that as, as policymakers. I, I very much hope so. And I'm you know, uh, hoping to do my best to change it. 
Um, but this is something also where I would be happy to see and, and talk uh, with the industry, with the chemical and petrochemical industry, because ultimately uh, it's about their own survival. You know, you see now what we face in, in the car industry, where we saw for years the European car industry blocking uh, the kind of the push for cleaner transportation. Uh, the end result is that we have to put billions of European taxpayers' euros uh, into battery alliances and building up kind of a, a, a zero pollution trans uh, transportation systems uh, and almost kind of rescuing them because you know they've been overtaken by China and uh, Elon Musk. And I think this is what we can potentially face, and this is where we are at the start of the disruption. And this is where the European chemicals industry and especially the petrochemicals which are involved in plastic um, should wake up because they will go bankrupt. Uh, and yes, they can help to pull the rest of us and the civilization down with themselves, but that's, hopefully we will manage to prevent that. But in the process, um, yeah, it's gonna cost lots of jobs uh, and then massive losses. So. Uh, I think it's also about having the, you know, investments moving in the right direction and having the um, uh, public money moving in the right direction. These are going to be very, very crucial elements. And that's where I believe in taxonomy and really trying to channel the money in into the right place. Yes, thank you. So you mentioned the, the taxonomy and I would like to... Um... Kind of play the question back to Sam as well, who's um, very knowledgeable uh, on EU policies to tackle uh, emissions as well. So what is the role of the petrochemical industry currently and maybe in the future um, when it comes to tools that the EU can use to tackle emissions, such as the European emission, emission trading system, but also the um, uh, industrial emissions directive, uh, which as of now does not include greenhouse gas emissions, but maybe um, you can elaborate a little bit on that. Um, how how does how is the EU how is the petrochemical industry in the EU integrated in climate policies? And if you have knowledge on that, maybe you can also say something about the methane strategy. Yes, thanks. Um, not sure if I will say a lot about the methane strategy, but for the rest, let me start by agreeing uh, strongly with what Martin just said uh, on on the need to get investments uh, in the right direction. Um, this is also a story of getting clean technologies off the ground in the right time frame, and this is urgent. But at the same time, we need to realize there are lots of hidden subsidies to pollute still handed out to these sectors. And it's also a no-brainer that this should end uh, in Europe. Um, what I'm talking about specifically, um, is uh, again, the role of the free emission allowances under the European emissions trading system. Why are we having these? Because um, the, the industries, not only the chemical sector, steel and cement uh, have been uh, particularly effective at this as well, have uh, managed over the past decade to convin convince policymakers that putting a carbon price on their pollution will basically drive industry outside of Europe um, and they will pollute further uh, elsewhere, and then it doesn't do anybody any good. Uh, over and over again, uh, researchers, um, analyzes uh, has, has shown that this is not the case. Carbon leakage, by and large, has been a myth under European climate policies currently. It is not taking place at all. There is no detectable evidence uh, of this. Um, but yet, it continues to happen at massive scale. The... Um, uh, European uh, emissions trading system foresees that after, as of next year until 2030, 6.3 billion tons of CO2 will be basically handed out in the shape of free emission allowances to these industrial sectors. The monetary value of that is 165 billion euros over the decade. That's your incentive to pollute for free, basically, uh, including for the plastics and petrochemical sector. Now, an adding insult to, to injury is that last month, the, the European Commission uh, adopted uh, guidelines for state aid for so-called indirect cost compensation, 
basically this is for electro intensive industry so also um, the petrochemical industry consumes lots of electricity um, as the electricity prices include uh, a component of carbon pricing as well right now uh, those industries have managed to get back on a list for state aid um, rules and member states uh, again in the coming at least five years possibly another decade can give uh, subsidies to the industrial sectors. There are no strings attached. Uh, there, there are limits on the maximum amount of aid, but uh, it's very generous. It will not lead to further greenhouse gas emission reductions. So if we don't manage to phase out those things um, very rapidly, uh, then uh, you can throw all the good, uh, clean innovation money after and finance after the sector that you want, but then the incumbents will have no incentive to de to decrease their their pollution going forward, um, and that's really problematic because I, I, I can I can see a space where uh, also the chemical uh, industry contributes to those climate goals. I mean. We have to be also uh, honest in that, that to some extent it will be impossible to do it without chemicals. If we talk about wind turbines, batteries, electric motors, solar panels, etc., et you need a lot of those products from, from the sector. But um, it's no excuse to continue business as usual. Uh, and you need better plans uh, and investments that will eventually lead to, to, to deep reductions and climate neutrality uh, in the sector. And... Let me finish by saying um, I fully agree. Carbon pricing or emissions trading there is not going to be a silver bullet. Um, it helps in the sense that it, uh, if, it's, if it's successful to put a price on pollution, you have that signal throughout the economy um, and um, markets are pretty good at finding the cheapest emission reduction options underneath. In the power sector, we've seen in specifically that this has been successful because it's been complemented by other policy instruments. There are energy saving targets uh, in Europe. There are binding renewable energy targets. Some member states have implemented carbon floor pricing uh, in parallel with the EU ETS. And then you have support schemes for renewable energies for the petrochemical sector and energy intensive industries. We will need to get a lot smarter as well in having multiple instruments working in parallel with uh, full carbon pricing for uh, the sector. And this is, again, it's about innovation funding, but also what you mentioned, for example, these are the Industrial Emissions Directive, um, which deals with a lot of um, air quality parameters currently for industrial sectors. The Industrial Emissions Directive has a provision included in the legislation that basically disallows member states from regulating greenhouse gas pollutions through the industrial emissions directive. So if a company asks for an environmental permit uh, in a member state, then the member state, because there is a European emissions trading system, the member state cannot say, well, you should, here are some extra rules you should apply on, uh, on your carbon pollution. Now that's, unacceptable. Those are things from the past. And as the Industrial Emissions Directive is going to be reviewed in the coming year, uh, this needs to be uh, corrected. Um, and then there are other things. I really think the circular economy agenda is, is, is critical as well, um, because basically the best plastic we can have uh, in, in Europe uh, and in the world is the plastic we don't use. Uh, this is the most environmental friendly uh, way going uh, forward. Yes, thank you. That's also um, very important to remember. And Martin, um, you also briefly mentioned the hierarchy um, of, of waste that the, the plastic that's never produced is the best plastic that we can have. Um, so Sam, you, you mentioned a mix of, of instruments that we have and that we need to use in parallel. And in the chat, um, the question also popped up about um, a possible carbon border adjustment. And um, that's a very hotly debated topic right now. And um, in the pipeline at the commission, um, and we also have the um, methane strategy that could, um, you know, pick at least some low hanging fruits because a lot of em methane emissions that are associated with um, uh, shale gas, but also like uh, fossil fuel extraction along or plastic production along the entire supply chain could be avoided at more or less no uh, additional costs for the industry, um, venting and leakage, etc. Uh, so 
Martin or Kingsmill, um, any thoughts on the carbon border adjustment and the methane strategy and um, the potential to, to cut on emissions along the life cycle and upstream of plastics? I, I defer to the parliamentarian. Um, okay. I'm happy to talk about carbon taxes myself. Uh, the hot potato has been uh, passed and the <laughs> lands in my lap. Um, the, the carbon border adjustment, uh, I think it's important. Uh, and for me, this is uh, it's not about just carbon pricing and, and all these things. It's ultimately about um, the question of, of fairness and justice. If we don't have a situation where we would have a global deal that would be actually upheld and implemented curbing climate, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we need to have a mechanisms where we ensure a level playing field for uh, the European economy. It's not something that it's a desired thing. If you would have a global system, I think it would be better um, if it would be sufficiently ambitious. But this is a simply to ensure that uh, we cannot be not only dumped on um, the end, uh, but also that there is no motivation really to export uh, the pollution. Because um, I, I, I hear about the kind of the carbon leakage argument, but um, I think what we what we have to what we have to make sure that we saw a lot of the expansion, especially the you know I work with the toxic chemicals a lot. Um, and relocation of the production of some hazardous chemicals outside of the EU uh, because of the regulation. So that's one aspect. And the other aspect, I think it will help, since we have such a massive market, it will help to drive uh, and put a pressure on other countries to kind of go along uh, similar targets and go along similar climate ambition as, as we have. Um, and I will be very keen to hear uh, from, from fellow panelists on where do they think uh, there are potential risks or how to make it work in the best possible way. I think this is this conversation is very, very important to have. In regards to methane strategy, um, I think that there is, it's, I was expecting more, to be very honest. Uh, and uh, there is way more that needs to be done that the, Sorry? Sorry, just for the audience that are maybe not all that much uh, informed about the methane strategy because it wasn't necessarily debated by a larger public, um, the petrochemical industry is uh, basically not really um, in that strategy at all. It addresses three main um, sectors, uh, energy, waste and agriculture. Um, and maybe um, Andy Georgiou, he wants to post uh, more infos in the chat, but just as a, as a background for um, listeners that are not that informed on the methane strategy. Sorry. That, that's the that's one side of it. That's the other thing. It's kind of the for me uh, only first steps and not sufficient ambition of working uh, with the supply chain. You know, this is something that's the 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 skeleton in the closet of the of the gas industry is ultimately uh, the um, upstream. It's who can tell with authority how much methane is being leaked from the production and transportation in Russia. You know. There are estimates thanks to the Copernicus program, and they're not looking very rosy. Uh, the same thing with the now uh, kind of uh, lifting any any regulation that uh, the Trump administration is doing on this sec on the on the fracking sector. Um, that's another concern, and uh, and there are data which show that some of the sources of gas can be worse than coal. Which you know I'm not a fan of coal, uh, and uh, this is something which which I think we need to have more ambition to address within the um, methane strategy. But also we need to be realizing again here that uh, as, as a methane strategy for me, kind of prime link to natural gas, is we should follow, uh, just like in the waste hierarchy, in the energy usage, the energy hierarchy, which is energy efficiency first, then the renewables, and only then we look at some potential transitional use of gas. Um, what is going to be crucial in the gas strategy is what are going to be the actual steps, be it on the on kind of uh, the policy practice level in terms of international cooperation negotiations, but also in terms of any any legislative steps? Because um, strategies are nice, uh, but actually, what we need is a real action, and that's something which uh, you know, when you look at uh, 
the challenges that we have uh, with uh, the very good biodiversity strategy, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, and then we have common agriculture policy. You know, it's that's that's where where that's where we face. We have we have great strategies, and we need to have equally great legislation. Um, this strategy yes, could be better. Point. So also, maybe we can make region. legislation better than the strategy. There is nothing to stopping us. Yes, thank you. Very good point. I think it's always uh, important to remember also when talking about the European Green Deal that oftentimes it contains a lot of strategies and we are still waiting for these strategies to be implemented and and, um, and that legislative acts are actually derived from it. So um, we are watching closely what the European Commission is doing and how the European Green Deal actually becomes more concrete and more touchable. And one legislative um, act would be the carbon border adjustment. And Sam, you mentioned in the chat that you would um, like to elaborate a little bit further on that. Yes, thanks. Uh, um, I, I forgot to mention it earlier. And I think it is important because it is right now um, uh, the public consultation by the European Commission has just closed uh, today or yesterday, I believe, and I, I shared a link to our briefing we, we submitted in parallel with answering the questionnaire. Uh, in the European Parliament, there are also, there's also an own initiative report on this being uh, considered, um, and it is indeed one of those hot potatoes uh, as well. I think there are a couple of um, uh, principles, main points to keep in mind when considering a carbon border adjustment uh, mechanism. And first is the question, which problem are we trying to solve uh, really? Um, and I highlighted before that I, I don't think currently carbon leakage is a major uh, issue, um, but yet we do have uh, a lot of provisions in place that protect against carbon leakage. And I think the way the European Commission had set out the ambitions in the Green Deal to establish a carbon border adjustment mechanism as an alternative to existing uh, uh, measures to prevent carbon leakage under the EU ETS was the right one. Uh, and I am looking forward to the European Parliament also clearly uh, supporting that aim of the Green Deal uh, uh, enshrined uh, uh, in there. Um, why is this important? Because we cannot allow these industries to continue to A, pollute for free inside Europe, and then B, at the same time, be protected against um, uh, imports coming from, from elsewhere. You, you need to you do it either or, but you cannot have, have it both ways. Um, and a second component is that um, we believe a carbon border adjustment mechanism should really serve to decrease pollution further in Europe, but also inspire the rest of the world to follow suit. Um, and this means you need to be smart in the way you design it. Um, if, it's a, if it's a very blunt instrument based on average uh, carbon performance parameters, um, it's not going to incentivize um, importers of these materials into Europe to uh, move to cleaner production uh, routes. And, and therefore, and it, I think it is going to be a, a big challenge. This will take a while, but therefore you really need to make sure um, Europe also gets a clear understanding of what is the carbon footprint of different uh, imports depending on where they come from and where they are produced. Um, so it needs to be a granular system. Um, and then last but not least, uh, a, a lot of industrial sectors are currently also in Europe are also asking that they would be that the exports would be exempted from the carbon border adjustment mechanism, basically giving them a rebate as soon as the goods are exported outside of Europe. Uh, also, this would blunt and it would mute the carbon price signal. Uh, it could even lead to a perverse incentive where basically the most uh, polluting uh, installations in Europe uh, are choosing to export their goods because then they would get rebated and don't have to uh, carry any of the carbon costs anymore. Um, so there's lots of uh, devilish details uh, underneath in there. I, I shared a link to our paper, which has 10 principles uh, outlined uh, and a lot more detail uh, in there. But this is, this is going to be important, um, not only for steel, cement, um, but also for the petrochemical sector. It's um, definitely worthwhile to consider it in, uh, in more detail. Thanks. Lisa, may, yes. I, uh, may I bring yes. in the 
the global perspective on this because um, I mean, there is there is an elephant in the room or an elephant we hope no longer in the room after Tuesday. So, you know, exactly. Could... I was just about to ask you actually because we are we only have like seven and a half minutes left, and I did want to ask you about the potential outcome of the election, how that might you know ha impact global gas and, and markets and petrochemical industries in yeah. the US and here. Just, but, but with relation to this carbon border adjustment tax, I mean, you know, at the moment, the big impediment to change is the current Trump administration, because you, you know, within the last month, you've had the Chinese basically say they want to have net zero by 2060. Um, you've got Japan, you've got Korea, you've got Europe. Um, if on, you know, after Tuesday, we get America as well, and then, then we'll, we'll have um, all, all of the world's leading countries searching for solutions to get to net zero by the middle of the middle of the century. They're going to very quickly find that they need to start taxing carbon everywhere, and one way to achieve that is to have these carbon border adjustment taxes. Because you know, if we if we levy it at 50 euros a ton, um, then actually the Chinese will quite quickly work out that um, if they levy it at 50 euros a ton, then they have to pay the tax. Um, and, and actually, that's how you get it to that's how you get it to go global. And 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 that's why I think it's it's one of those ideas which I, I understand has been really really tough for many years. But it's one of those ideas whose moment has come, and we shouldn't forget that. Yes, thank you. And do you also want to to comment on these, you know, linkages between uh, the U.S. shale gas boom and um, the expansion of the petrochemical industry in the U.S. and also to some extent in the EU, and how um, potential policy changes in the U.S. could also impact that at the EU level? Yeah, it's really significant because I mean, as, as, as again has been mentioned, uh, the. The, the, the growth in petrochemical supply, a large part of it comes from all of, all of this U.S. shell gas, which is looking for profitable um, areas to go. And and therefore, once you get you know, a, a, an administration that actually cares about the health of its people a little bit um, and starts to curtail it, then you're going to have, um, uh, you're, you're, sorry, you'll have consequences uh, from that. Uh, so, yeah, it, 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 it will reduce the amount of new supply coming on stream. And, but it would just have a very different um, global uh, glo global environment as a result. Okay, thank you. Um, we have just over five minutes left. Um, one issue that we haven't really touched upon um, is taxing uh, plastics itself and the ongoing debate also at the EU level on a pla on a tax on on plastics and how that may impact things. Um, you know, as a as a own resource for the EU, that's one of the one of the taxes and one of the policies policy measures that is currently being debated. And I would like to combine that uh, that question with um, a last question to all of you with like a brief statement of one or two measures that you would really like to see implemented if you had to choose um, in the next you know coming years. Maybe Martin, you want to start with um, that own resource question and maybe also your your wish. I had a wish, no time to think about the wishes. Uh, the own resources, I think it's an interesting initiative. I, I The devil will be again in the detail on how it will be, how it will be built. But uh, in principle, uh, I'm in favor of it. Uh, I've been uh, supporting it since, since it came about. I think it's important also, it's kind of it's seen as a progressive, the more you recycle, the less you pay. The trick here will be, and that's why I'm saying the detail, because, you know, uh, we sometimes think that we recycle a lot in Europe, but actually we are able to collect quite a bit, but then we don't know how to recycle it. And we used uh, in the past years until they stopped it to ship it to China and China stopped and then we shipped it uh, to Southeast Asia. So I think this is uh, where we need to see on how uh, the details of how this tax will be not collected, but specified that it's not only about collecting the uh, plastic waste, but also about actually recycling and not again, not only just recycling, not downcycling it, for example, because you see, uh, see things like, oh, let's put the plastic into the roads. Uh, I don't know if this is something which can be done in the long term because then we have to pay the entire planet with all this. <laughs> so um, that's where, yes, I'm in favor, but it, we need to do it right. Uh, and in terms of the of the last uh, kind of the wishes, um, I think that uh, or my my big wish is that uh, uh, the 
policymakers and businesses alike, I think I'm less concerned actually about the public, uh, finally wake up to the fact that we are facing uh, a major disruption. And I'm not talking only about the, the kind of the impeding really climate disaster. I'm talking about the major breakthroughs that we have in terms of uh, technology and what we can actually achieve now. And uh, for the sake of themselves, but also us all uh, as a society, try to fundamentally rethink the way we do business and we run economy. I think this is incredible opportunity we have on our hands. It's not about the cost. It's actually about how much money we can make out of this, even if I can appeal this way to, you know, kind of the profit-seeking entrepreneurs. I think this is where we can turn it into something good. And let's not lose this opportunity because, uh, yeah, um, well, I can talk for my children. They will not forgive Yes, thank you. I also I, I I think it's also an employment argument to make here, right? In the in the time of crisis, when we rethink the economy and, and reuse systems and refill systems, etc. So sorry, we're running out of time. Uh, Sam, please a short statement on like your most wishful um, thinking. Yes, thanks. Um, from a carbon market perspective, um, the main thing to do is to phase out all free emission allowances under the European emissions trading system and instead move to a system of 100% auctioning of uh, the emission allowances. And the benefit of doing that would not only mean that you actually pay a price for your pollution, but the revenues can and should be smartly reinvested into climate solutions. And then I think even the plastics and petrochemical sector could get a share of this. Uh, and to help them decarbonize further. Uh, but continuing to allow them to pollute for free is uh, unacceptable if we're aiming for climate neutrality. Thank you. That was very clear. And now King's Mill. And if you feel more comfortable, you can also use that like as an elevator pitch for um, investors. Um, you can choose whether you want to talk about policies or the main arguments for investors. Well, just very quickly on policy, uh, to echo the, um, the excellent comments of my two fellow panelists, which is that we should be taxing um, plastic uh, production at source with no with no exceptions, and that's it. And and particularly now that um, policymakers have more power, uh, they should just do it and and stop. Um, uh, I guess listening to special interests. Just I mean, that's what government is for is to, to tax externalities. And, and as for investors, I mean, we we've very clearly been saying to investors that. If they invest in the expansion of the industry, they will like Ellie's pitch. Thank you so much. I don't know if that ends automatically. Okay, no, it doesn't. It just says minus two now. Um, thank you so much for having been so clear. Thank you for your time, for joining in. And um, we will now, I will now briefly uh, wrap up in the next session, but um, I don't think that you will be on stage. So uh, really a warm, warm thank you to all of you. And um, I, again, invite our audience to check out the, the Futures Not in Plastics report, the briefings of Carbon Market Watch, and um, all the good resources that were posted in the chat. So see you in the next session. Thank you so much. <laughs>